We're in the book of John. We took a little break last Sunday to talk about uh, home groups and community. But in a way, it kind of actually fits into what we've been talking about in the book of John because he talks about loving one another a lot. Okay, but we're back now in the book of John and uh, we aim to finish it by next week. So two, two more sermons in this book. We're in the last chapter of 1 John, John 1 John chapter 5. Uh, and allow me to read through today's passage for us before we actually unpack it and see what the Spirit and what John is trying to teach us through this letter. Verse 1 onwards, I'm reading in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1 onwards. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit, and the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. A powerful passage. A very black and white passage. One pastor talking about the book of the letter of 1 John says, John only seems to have two colors in his palette when he paints. Black and white. That's it. There's nothing else. If you read through the book of 1 John, you find that he doesn't leave much room for gray area. There is nothing. It's either this or that. He paints two extremes. That's it. You're either in one group or you're in the other. You can't dwindle and, 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 uh, and dawdle around in the middle and say, I'm sometimes here and sometimes there. I, I sometimes like to walk in the light, but you know the darkness is quite fun as well. No, you're either in the darkness or you're in the light. And he, that, that's the nature of his letter. And if you look at church history, if you look through the, 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 the story, the Christian narrative, the church narrative, you find that one of the key questions that keeps coming up is, am I a believer? Am I really a child of God? And then when you get past that, the next question is, is the person in front of me really a child of God or not? How do we know the children of God? That's one question that kept, keeps coming up in Christian faith. All the way back to before the, the time of the Reformation, we looked last October at the Reformation series when we talked about what happened during the Reformation. But during that time or before that time, the Catholic Church seemed to answer this question by saying, a believer, you, what makes you a believer? What is the evidence of your salvation? It's your membership to the church and your participation in the sacraments. That's what made you a believer. And so the, the, the church held a monopoly over who was a believer or not through its functions, through its rituals. And as you look through church history, you find that very often, wrongly so, the church has reduced being a believer, becoming a believer to works. And we peddle a salvation through works kind of a doctrine where you can work to earn your salvation. But that's not the truth of the Bible. The truth of the Bible is salvation is through faith and faith in Jesus. But that faith is not without works. It outworks itself. You don't work for salvation. You work because of salvation. It's a very different uh, uh, formula. Slightly it changes in the words but a very different formula. But that's been one of the questions all along. Who is a believer? What makes you a believer? And that's what John is answering through this letter. Who are the children of God? Who are the children of light? And he gives you characteristics by which you can look at yourself. And why am I saying about why am I talking about how the Catholic Church and others have, have taught about this before? Because you have to understand that John is not saying that these works save you. He is saying that these are the works of the saved person. 
It is faith that saves you. But that faith results in what John has been laboring throughout this book of 1 John. He gives you, like I've been saying over the last few weeks, and Pastor Joy has said before, he gives you these markers, these checkpoints to check your faith, to do a faith check about yourself. Am I really living the child of God life or am I not? Am I really in the faith or am I not? Have I fooled myself? And today he's going to give us three headings. Now under these headings, you can have an entire sermon series on each of the headings and we would go through the entire year. But this morning, we're just going to look at the headings and get a bit of a taster as John would give us. Verse 1, he says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And so the first, the first check, the first heading under which you can check your faith is a doctrinal test. It is a test of doctrine what is doctrine it is the core beliefs of a community the central beliefs that a community holds whether it's political religious or anything else it is doctrine by definition is the core set of values and beliefs that a community holds and so the, the first heading under which he's going to give us a test to uh, to check our faith by is a doctrinal test and he says, anyone who believes, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. Everyone. Firstly, you've got to see it's everyone. Anyone that, that the door is open to anyone. If you believe, he doesn't, he doesn't take uh, barriers of ethnicity, language, income, nothing. He says, anyone, everyone. If you would believe. Believe. And now that's a very important word to understand in this whole marker of doctrine believe he doesn't say anyone who agrees belief is much heavier than what we have watered it down to be today today we get away with just agreeing that Jesus is God today we get away by just singing that Jesus is God today we just get away by agreeing on Sunday that Jesus is God so I'm a Christian because I agree because the argument was really good the pastor either spoke really well or he shouted really loudly, scared me into agreeing. But I agree, this must be true. But the problem with mere agreement is tomorrow if somebody shouts louder or speaks better, you'll agree. I'll agree over there. And the Bible doesn't call us to agree that about what he's going to talk about. He says you got to believe. Believe is deeper, it's richer. Believing, when the Bible talks about believing in the Son, when the Bible talks about believing in God, believing is this committed allegiance towards. Believing is not agreeing. Believing is far deeper, far richer than agreeing. Believing permeates every part of your being. Believing outworks itself into every aspect of your life. Believing becomes that bedrock, that foundation beneath you. The reason why you do anything. That's believing. That's the kind of believing the Bible talks about. And he says everyone who believes this believes. What? Believes what? That Jesus is the Christ. So is Christian doctrine, Christian core beliefs, just that one line, Jesus is the Christ? No, it's much greater. If you get into the doctrines and theology of, of Christianity, you find that there's a whole range of doctrines to believe in. But I submit to you that every single one of those hinges on the truth that Jesus is who he says he is. I said that last week, I said that the week before. John said that last week, John said that the week before and John's saying it this week. That's why I have to say it again. That, that core belief, that, that core belief system of ours, everything hinges on this one truth that Jesus is who he says he is. Because in that it's what, is what separates us from everybody else. Every other faith system has a belief in God. Every other faith system has a creation account. Every other faith system has a problem of sin. Every other faith system has its own answer to the problem of sin. However happy you are with that answer or not, every religion, every faith system has an answer to the problem of sin in the world and sin within your own heart. But only in the Christian narrative, only in the Christian worldview, only within this worldview and in the biblical worldview do you find that the answer to sin is a person 
in Jesus. While every other faith has a man of God or God himself incarnate come down, ours has a different kind of a God incarnate. Not in the narrative of how he came, but in the, in the narrative of what he said about himself. Because every other faith system, you'll have a man of God or God incarnate who comes down and says, let me show you the way. But Jesus says, I am the way. Every other faith system, God comes down and says, let me show you the truth. Let me teach you about truth. But Jesus says, I am the truth. It begins in me. Every other religion, every other faith system will say, let me show you the, the, the life. Let me give you life. And Jesus says, I am the life. And so Jesus' teachings are different. It's what sets us apart from anyone else. That's the difference. But if you don't believe he is who he says he is, then there's no point believing his teaching. And you're not set apart. And so everything about Christianity hinges on whether you believe Jesus is who he says he is. And John labors that through this book. He keeps driving it home. You got to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. It all begins right there. Keep in mind, right in chapter 1, as Pastor Joy taught you all over here, and then in home group we studied together, that one of the reasons why John was writing this letter was to address the Gnostic philosophy, the problem that had crept up, where they were playing around with the personhood of who Jesus was because of their beliefs. They were playing around with either the divinity or the humanity of Jesus. And John is addressing that. And Jesus claimed to be both man and God. John is saying you can't mess with that. Which is why in, this, in the first verse he says you've got to believe he's the son of God. But later on he goes on in verse 6 to labor that doctrine of Jesus. Where he says it, it's true who he says he is. In verse 9 he says, you accept, you, you take in the testimony of men. You need, if somebody says something, you need witnesses. You need the testimony of men to come up and say, he's right. This is true. You will accept it. You get, uh, facts are validated by men coming up and saying, this is true. You accept the testimony of men. How much greater the testimony of God? And from verse 6 to verse 9, he's talking about the, Jesus coming through the water and the blood and the Spirit of God testifying about him. And he's saying that God has borne witness about this Jesus that he is the sent one. He is the one. If you accept the testimony of men, why will you not accept the testimony of God about this Jesus? Verse 9, if we receive the testimony of men, a testimony of God is greater. And God has borne testimony about this son concerning Jesus the son. Why is it so important to believe who Jesus says he is? Because God has said Jesus is who he says he is. And the moment you say Jesus is not who he says he is, you are saying God is a liar. So either God's a liar or you're a liar. Both can't be truthful but saying opposite things at the same time about the same fact. We both can't say opposite things and both be true. One is a liar. And so it makes complete sense. John says, if you disagree with who Jesus says he is, but God has said he is who he says he is, then you are saying, in effect, God is a liar. And how can you be a child of God then? How can you be someone who says, I love God and I'm walking with God, but God's a liar. Because if you accuse God of being a liar at one point, then God is a liar or potentially a liar about everything else. And there is no point following him. So either God's a liar or you got it wrong. Let's give you the benefit of the doubt. You're not a liar. You just got it wrong. And so the first test that he has, is a doctrinal test. But doctrine hinges on who Jesus says he is. And you need to settle that in your heart today. Is Jesus a good teacher to you? Is Jesus, does, does Jesus give you good suggestions on how to live your life? Or is Jesus the very foundation and bedrock of everything you are? 
do you believe or do you agree that Jesus is God because if you agree then Jesus is just another one of those things that you agree with in your life but belief changes everything about who you are belief is about putting the entire weight of who you are onto this one truth that Jesus is who he says he is which means he is God which means everything about your life has to then function around that one truth everything all the directions of your life start to find their their direction from this one truth that Jesus is who he says he is so the first test for you this first heading for you and for me this morning is a doctrinal one that the doctrine that 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 faith check of Jesus being who he says he is but do you just agree do you not agree firstly secondly do you just agree or do you really believe do we really believe that Jesus is the Christ and very quickly he goes on to the second test pretty much in that same breath he says everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the father loves the, loves whoever has been born of God and so the, the first test is a doctrinal test the second one is a social test and John has been laboring this as well throughout his letter because he says if you say you believe in Jesus then one of the immediate outworkings of that belief in Jesus is a radical love for those who have been born of God it will show in your life by this love for the people of God not because they are amazing and we talked about that last week that God kind of love that agape kind of love doesn't love based on the character before it but loves based on the character within it that's God kind of love and he says that that if you're born of God and you say you love the father then you will love those who are born of the father and so a second marker the second heading for you to look at your life and for me to look at my life is the social test the social marker the love marker do we have that ability to love the children of God? See, it's easy to love others outside, or let's say it's easier to love out others outside. We show great sympathy towards the poor. We show great sympathy towards the oppressed. But when we come here, we struggle to love one another over here. Does loving one another mean we'll never, never disagree? We'll never have a fight. We'll never, uh, never get into an argument. No, it doesn't mean that. It does not mean that. I attended another home group uh, just to change, uh, change my view for a while, just to change the environment for a while from my own home group. I went and visited this week with another home group. And one of the questions they were talking about is, you know, why do churches split and denominations and all that stuff? And they were saying, you know, that change is inevitable. Sometimes it's like that. And that's true. That's not that we, we never disagree. In my family, my children disagree at least seven times a day. There's fights in the day. They will argue with each other in the day. They both think they're right about something. In fact, sometimes there'll be arguments between my children and me. They think they're right. I think I'm right. There is in a family, there is disagreement, there is argument, but there is also an expectation, an underlying expectation that at the end of the day, we love each other. Love is not a threat in this whole thing. Love is something that is celebrated in a family. You can disagree, but there is love at the end of the day. You, it comes from a place of love rather than a place of hate. And that's what John is saying over here. He's saying if you love the father, you love those born of him. The expectation on our life as a believer is to love. You can't, and I said this two weeks ago, if you have somehow, if I have somehow managed to construct a faith system that excuses bitterness and hate within me, it is not the faith system of God. It is not the commands of God. And I need to look at my faith system once again in the light of who God is says I should be a faith system that excuses hatred and bitterness is not the life that Jesus has called us to live the command of God the expectation of God 
is that we love and this is why it becomes so important you know people say i'm not a morning person i prefer to have my quiet time late in the evening when i'm you know i'm more awake and all those kind of things and i i'll tell you i'm not a very great morning person either i'm not a very great night person either i don't know what kind of a person i am but and i i debated that i argued that and i i thought the same thing you know in the morning i'm a bit sleepy and stuff so it, when i'm more alert i should study the word of god but i found that it makes so much sense to get up in the morning and spend time with god because otherwise what happens is you go out into your day trying to love people pouring out the last drops of love from your heart into them but god has not intended you to do that god has intended for me and for you to spend time with him basking in his love being full of his love so that the rest of the day it's an overflow of how he has loved you how he has loved me when you spend time with god in the morning just just basking in how he has loved you the magnitude to which he has loved you the volume with which he has loved you then you allow that love to be an overflow from your life into those around you when i was you know struggling with this whole thing of morning as my quiet times are not so good in the morning they're too quiet when it happens in the morning i want to do it later when i'm more alert i just felt uh, and and just like this voice inside me said told me so when you when i get up in the morning and and i and i remember using this as one of my quotable quotes my randomness in my head uh, but when you when you spend time with god in the morning he tells you how to live the day but when i spend time with god in the evening he tells me how i should have lived the day and so when i spend time with god in the morning i have a day full of purpose when i spend time with god in the evening i have a night full of repentance because if only i knew earlier i wouldn't have done that and it's the same with love you get up in the morning you spend time with god just enjoy not not because it's ritualistic i have to study something pastor i am not getting anything from my bible just just if you're not understanding it you're somewhere in the middle of leviticus and you're struggling to understand it just spend time with god and just enjoy how he has loved you and let that love then out pour out of you overflow out of you in the day because otherwise you'll burn out when you try to love people you will burn out when you try to love people he says whoever loves the father uh, whoever loves the father loves whoever has been born of him verse 3 by this we know that we are the children of god how do you know you are the children of god when we love god and obey his commands uh, by by this we know that we love the children of god sorry when we love god and we lo- and we obey his commands now john is not a fool He's not saying you know when you obey the sabbath you're loving the children of god no that's not he's talking about the command specific to loving the children of god how do i love the people of god how do i love god's body god has told you in the word how to love he has taught you through one john john has talked about it but through all the other episodes and all the other books in the bible as you read you find god telling you how to love better how to love one another better what god love looks like this god kind of love what it looks like between you and me and so he says how do you know you're loving the children of god when you keep the commands regarding loving the children of god that god has given you and that's how we love the people of god but then he goes on to his third marker He says for this in verse 3 for this is the love of God this is how we love God so this is how we know we love the children of God and now he says this is how we love God for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and so you've got a whole lot of commandments about how to love the people of God but then there's a whole other uh, wider circle of commandments about how to live and how to love those who are not the children of God how to love God himself there are a whole range of commandments about how to live purely before god and he says you love when you obey 
Now John again didn't concoct this randomly. He heard Jesus say it in John chapter 14 in that upper room when Jesus tells the disciples, whoever keeps my commandments, it is him who loves me. And John is just parroting, he's just paraphrasing, he's just repeating Jesus' own words. He says, if you want to love God, you've got to keep his commandments. And it makes actually complete sense. Because you can only obey if you trust. And you can only love people you trust. See, it is possible to trust someone you don't love. But it is impossible to love someone that you don't trust. Let me, give, let me say that again. Okay, and then I'll, I'll, I'll show you how it's true. It is possible to trust somebody that you don't love. It is possible to trust without love. But it is impossible to love without trust. An example of the first. This morning I got up and I took an Uber to come here. I got into, the, into that cab and I trusted the guy with my life. I trusted he won't kidnap me. I trusted that he'll get me here. I trusted that he'll get me here quick. I trusted that he'll get me here not too quick. I trusted that he'll bring me here not overcharge me at one point I said take a left he said but yeah GPS is showing this side I said okay go wherever it's saying I trusted him but there was no love I didn't get into the cab and feel warmth in my heart like man I didn't get in and think Kiran has come his name was Kiran my driver today I didn't get in and feel this that's the guy I was hoping would drive me I didn't sit in the back with a flutter in my stomach it was in that case there's no deep love for the driver but there was trust I trusted him in that moment. So it is possible to trust without any love. But it is impossible to love, especially to love the way God has called us to love, without trust. You can't love without trust. Because if you don't trust someone, which is why in, in, in marriages and in relationships, when trust starts to leak, you start to help them build trust back in. That's the first thing you do. Do things that build trust back into your relationship. Don't merely start doing lovey-dovey things. Because trust is what is leaking. Once trust starts to leak out, love starts to leak out very fast as well. It is impossible to love without trusting. And so you can't say, I love God, I love Jesus, I love this whole Christian thing. But I, you know, I don't want to do what he says. It doesn't work. It cannot work. And so it makes complete sense when Jesus says, and when John repeats what Jesus said, if you want to love God, you got to obey His commandments. But I love what He says next. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not heavy. My dear friend, my dear church family member, my brother, my sister, has your Christian life become a burden to you? Sometimes when you see a, a, a phrase like this, it pays, it, it, it's a great thing to see who is writing it. John is writing it. When is he writing it? Towards the end of his life is what Bible scholars would tell us. John, uh, historians would tell us, died about 100 AD. And so if you go with all those facts, you know that by now, John the Apostle, he has seen Jesus die. By now, he has seen Stephen, the first martyr of the church, being stoned to death. By now, he has seen Peter being crucified upside down. By now he has seen Matthew being nailed to the ground with short spears and bled out to death. By now he has seen Paul being beheaded. By now he has seen one by one the apostles being killed, martyred for the sake of the gospel. By now he has seen James being thrown off the temple roof, somehow surviving and then being beaten and stoned to death. By now John has been exiled on the island of Patmos for four years at an old age. 
By now John has seen persecution after persecution against the church. By now John has seen Christians being thrown to the lions. By now John has seen Christians being burnt at the stake for the sake of the gospel. By now John, this is 180, by now John has seen the incredibly devastating sick persecution of Emperor Nero against the church in 70 AD. Go and read the history books from secular historians and they will tell you how grotesque his persecution of the church was. John has lived through all of this. The only apostle who wasn't martyred. John sees all of this with all that wealth of experience of suffering and pain for following Jesus. Seeing all that, John sits somewhere, probably scholars tell us in Ephesus, somewhere in a room and he pens these beautiful words. His commands are not burdensome. Mind-blowing to our context because I look at his life and all that he went through and he says it is not burdensome to follow Jesus and yet for me I have to get up and study my Bible I have to tell people in this culture it's a dangerous culture to tell people about Jesus I have to keep on doing this I have to say no to that I have to say yes to this I have to help out in church I have to do this I have to give I have to love oh my god it's so difficult to be a Christian it's so hard it is so burdensome. How do we come back to that place with John to say it is not a burden to follow Jesus? What happened between then and now where Christian life is difficult for us today? Where it is a chore, where it is a burden, where we would sometimes almost, if we're honest with each other, sometimes we almost, just for a few days, I don't want to be a Christian. Because it's so hard. We've got into that place. How do we not go there? How do we stay in a place like John where following Jesus is not a burden, it is a joy? I'll tell you. When your relationship with Jesus becomes religion, it becomes burdensome. When you replace a relationship with a religion, it becomes burdensome. When you are following Jesus just because you don't want to disappoint anyone around you, it becomes burdensome. When you look at the world, when you take your eyes off Jesus and when the world seems to make more sense, when the world seems to be more attractive, then you look at the world and you're like, that makes sense actually. That looks quite good to do actually. Then to do what God says becomes a burden because you'd rather do that. That's why John says, his commandments are not burdensome for everyone who has been born of God has overcome the world. You have transcended the world. You've gone above that system. And you know that God's ways are better. Has faith become a religion? Or is it still a relationship, a love relationship with God see I'm married and do not commit adultery is not a burden because I love my wife I don't get up in the morning and say oh my god I've got to be faithful again because I love my wife not hurting the ones you love is not a burden to you because that's a relationship but your job sometimes feels burdensome because you don't have a relationship with it it's not out of love that you're there it's out of necessity that you are there is your faith out of necessity or out of love if it's become out of necessity if it's become because you have to keep everybody happy if it's become because you're getting something out of it then it has become a religion a ritualistic religion and it will be burdensome if it is not already burdensome to you but if you maintain a relationship with Jesus get up in the morning and see how God has loved you with an everlasting love it will not be a burden it will remain a relationship, a healthy, loving, growing relationship where God Almighty, not because you deserve it, but because He is a God of love, 
God loved you and gave himself for you. A doctrinal test that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. A social test. Are you able to love? Are you able to be that channel of God's love to flow through you? Not that you have to manufacture love. But are you able to let God love others through you? And an obedience test. Are you able to keep the commands of God? Not because you have to. Not because others will start looking down on you. Not because the church might ostracize you. Not because mommy and daddy will be disappointed if you don't. But because Jesus loves you. You just sang. And I was in tears as I was sitting there. In that song. Jesus, I belong to you. Jesus, I believe in you. You're the reason that I live. The reason that I am. With all, with all that I am. Jesus, you're the only reason. That's it. That's the only reason for me. Jesus, I, you, you basically sang this entire passage. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you are the son of God. Jesus, I belong to you. When, when you look at commandments and obedience, the issue of obedience, not how can I do, not, not obey because you know people will all get upset with me, but ask yourself, Jesus, I belong to you. Why would I play with this? Deliver me from this evil, God. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason I sing. You're the reason I live. You're the reason that I'll be able to love with all that I am. So I guess in some way I'm asking you to not just sing the song, but to live the truth in the week ahead and in your life ahead. Are we children of God? We tell the world we are, what kind of an advertisement, what kind of a testimony, what kind of a statement about the children of being children of God are we making? Do we believe that Jesus is who he says he is or do we just agree? Do we love the way God has loved us or have we concocted a faith system that excused hate and bitterness in our heart? And do we obey out of duty or out of love? Do we obey out of necessity or out of that relationship with God? Are you following a religion or are you walking in a relationship with the most sovereign God, the one who gave himself 